Hi, my name is Siobhan Braybrook, and I work at UCLA. Today I'm going to talk to you about cell walls. This first talk is going to be an introductory talk, where we go through some of the background of cell walls, where you find them, what they look like, and what their functions might be. In part two, we're going to talk about how cell walls actually help young seedlings perform their function. And in part three, we're going to go a little bit further afield and talk about the cell walls within seaweeds and how they might regulate growth within those organisms. So let's go ahead and jump right in and talk about cell walls and where we might find them. Cell walls are actually found throughout the tree of life. And so while we might often think of cell walls as being associated only with, for example, plants, which I will talk about today, you can also find them in seaweeds, again, the second topic that we'll be talking about today. But often you might think of them in terms of bacteria as well. So we know that bacteria have cell walls. And I'm going to show you an example of a cyanobacterial bloom down here. So this is an aerial photo that was taken from the sky. And what you can see is that everything looks so incredibly green because there are so many cyanobacteria in the waterways that they're just exploding with color. And that represents a huge amount of cell walls. Now, the difference between these organisms down here, the eubacteria, and the seaweeds and plants that we have up top is multicellularity. And that's going to become key during the talks later on in the series. Now, you'll see here one perhaps surprising branch of the tree of life that has cell walls is that of animals. And so here, you can see I have animals circled. There are animals which have cell walls. And it's a very particular special group called tunicates. So I'm going to show you one picture, and then I'm not going to talk about them anymore. <laughs> but what you can see here is an example of a beautiful tunicate that you can find in the sea. In fact, all tunicates grow in marine environments. So they're living in the water. They're battled by both the salt within the water, but also the waves and the currents. And so potentially, this building of cell wall material actually helps to keep them strong which is something we're going to see in both the plants and the seaweeds as a series of talks go through. So all of these organisms have cell walls. Is there anything in common with the type of cell walls that they have? Indeed, what we can see is that all the groups that I'm going to highlight here in brown actually have cell walls that are mostly made of what we would think of as sort of extracellular polysaccharides here in brown. So what that means is that you have the inside of the cell covered by a cell membrane, and that the material that's being produced by that cell to make its cell wall is actually going up above the membrane and sort of existing what we might think of as the exterior of the cell. And so there's long been this debate about whether or not the cell wall is part of a cell wall, or is it an extracellular matrix that's not really part of their body. But I tend to think of them, at least in plants and seaweeds, as an integral part of the plant cell, the seaweed cell, because you need them for those cells' shapes and functions, as we'll see. So what does the cell wall do? What are the functions that are so essential for walled cell organisms that they would retain this particular way of growing? Well, if you think about it, we have this polysaccharide matrix that's around the cell contents. And what that means is that inside the cell, you can build up a lot of internal pressure. For example, in a plant cell, the pressure can be up to 10 bar. That's way higher than you would find inside a car tire. That's a massive amount of pressure. So that cell wall has to both contain it, but also capitalize on it, which we'll talk about next. The cell wall doesn't just allow for that internal pressure to build up, but it also provides protection. Imagine you were an herbivore or some kind of fungus that was trying to enter inside this plant cell wall. Well, what's in that material might stop you from doing that, either because it doesn't taste good or it physically hurts your mouth parts. And so plant cell walls can provide a lot of protection to the internal contents. In addition, they provide strength. So while they're holding in that turgor pressure, they're also then providing a lot of structural stability to a plant. Plants do not have, nor any other walled organism, a skeleton like we do. Instead, their structure comes from this combination of the cell wall material and the pressure inside those cells. The other thing that cell walls do is they connect cells to their neighbors. And this is particularly important in multicellular organisms that have cell walls, like plants and seaweeds, where when you start off by generating two new daughter cells through division, you do that by actually laying down a new cell wall in the middle of an existing cell. And so what that means is that those two cells are intimately connected to each other 
for pretty much the rest of their lives. You don't have a lot of cell mobility like you do in animal systems. And so what your neighbor does is intimately going to influence what you do, specifically when we come to our last function, which is the regulation of cell shape and growth. So cell walls have really big consequences for cell growth. In any walled organism, you've got this rigid cell wall around you, this high internal pressure. And so if that cell wants to grow, if it wants to change its shape in any way, it has to do that by modifying that polysaccharide-based cell wall outside of it. So we can take a very simple example of this and think, let's imagine we have a lot of turgor pressure inside of this cell, but not all the cell walls yield the same way to that turgor pressure. So here we have our, our square cell, high turgor pressure. And it's going to grow, but it's going to grow in a particular way. It's going to become more rectangular. So it's going to grow more upwards than it does in width. And you could imagine that this could happen if the two sidewalls, sort of here in this axis, yielded easier to the turgor pressure than the two end walls, which might regulate the expansion in width. And this is a particular example that we tend to call anisotropic growth, where you have more growth in one direction than another. And this is the example that we're going to focus on in part two of the talk. Well, while this is perhaps a relatively simple example, you can think about this on a more complex way as well. Let's imagine that in this cell, we don't just have two walls different than other two walls, but instead we have different areas of each wall responding a little bit differently to pressure. What you could end up with is a really complex cell shape, something perhaps like this cartoon, where certain areas have yielded more than others, and you get this sort of more bulbous shape. But remember, all of those cells are going to be connected to their neighbors by their cell walls, too. So it's not only a single shell shape that's important, but how its neighbors fit with it as well. So I'm going to show you some real-life examples of plant cells as we can see them on the epidermis using a microscope. So wild cells can have amazing shapes. And this is potentially the thing that drew me to plant biology in the first place. You're going to see some beautiful patterns in the next few images. This is what the cells look like on the surface of an Arabidopsis leaf. Arabidopsis thaliana is a model species that we use a lot in the lab, but is also used in plant science as a whole. And we'll delve more into that in part two. But here you can see these puzzle-shaped cells on the epidermis of a leaf. Interestingly, they didn't start that way, like puzzle pieces that come out of a box. Instead, they started as cubes, and they had to grow into those shapes. So each cell and its neighbors have to accommodate each other as they're attaining their final shape for function. You can see that here, again, in the trichomes that cover the surface of an Arabidopsis leaf. So these are leaf hairs, and we call them trichomes because they have three branches. And if you think about that, you have a cube. It's got to develop three incredibly fine points because that's a single cell. This might not be very nice to chomp down on if you were an insect. So again, the cell wall is dictating cell shape, but that function that comes with that shape is vitally important as well. If you start putting cells together in an even larger tissue context, you can see that where cells grow and where cells don't grow ends up giving you shape and pattern as well. So this is an example of a developing Gerbera flower, much earlier than you would buy it in the market, when it's actually beautiful. But to me, this is quite beautiful. And what you can see is you have older flowers down at the bottom and more immature flowers near the center. And that where cells have expanded and where they haven't actually gives these little flowers and organs their eventual shape and therefore function. We can see this again in another example from a very early diverging land plant known as a liverwort. In this case, this is the surface of a liverwort called Marcantia. And where you've had a little bit more cell expansion, you start forming these little bulbous air pores. So not just an individual cell expanding, but also how it expands and is patterned with itself and its neighbors ends up giving you the cell function, the tissue function, and eventually organismal function. So let's recap for a moment what we've discussed so far. First of all, cell walls are present throughout the tree of life. They are not exclusively the domain of bacteria nor plants. Second, cell walls provide essential functions like support, connection, and defense. And in fact, all of these things would have been traits that evolved with these walled organisms as they first developed into multicellular creatures that we see today. Cell walls have to yield to pressure in order for a cell shape to change. This is a physical reality. And in fact, the way that the cell wall yields will dictate the eventual cell shape. 
And as we've just seen in some of our real life plant examples, the way that that's coordinated across a tissue will end up giving you an incredibly beautiful patterned and functioning organism. Okay. So what are cell walls actually made of? As I mentioned in the very beginning, we're talking mostly about polysaccharide cell walls. Well, those are sugars. So if we take another look at our little cartoon, we have the polysaccharides that are external to the cell membrane, but still part of the cell. And those are actually, in general, if we think now of plants and seaweeds, made up of three major polysaccharide components. You have cellulose, which are the strong fibers, as we'll see, that sort of connect um, the cell wall and give it its strength. Those are embedded within a gel matrix, which will be the second component we talk about. And there's some cross-linking, both between the gel matrix and the fibers, by the cross-links that I mentioned here. And all three of these components are polysaccharides. So again, they're based in sugars. There are some proteins there as well, although we're not going to talk about those today. So let's start with cellulose. So what is cellulose? Well, cellulose is an incredibly strong, rigid fiber that's inside the cell wall and wraps around cells and contributes, again, a lot of strength to the cell wall, but also influences cell expansion, as we'll see in part two. But what I want to do is focus you in on the bottom part of this diagram that's from the Department of Energy. So here we can see the cellul cellulose molecule. It's actually incredibly simple. You just have glucose molecules in a chain. And that linkage is always the same, and so you end up with a nice straight molecule. And what that means is that the cellulose is actually able to crystallize. It can come together with other cellulose molecules and form a nice rigid structure. This then bundles together in these crystalline cellulose microfibrils, as you can see here. And again, that's what's giving this fibrous nature to the cell wall, but that crystallinity is what really gives the cell wall its strength through cellulose. Where might you encounter cellulose? You eat it every day, but we actually use it and we use that strength and that fibrous nature as a material. So you're quite likely familiar with the fact that paper is made of cellulose, but so is cellophane. It's not actually plastic. In fact, it's made from cellulose, even though you might think it's a plastic. It is a naturally based material. <clears throat> Fibers that we make our clothes out of. My shirt is made out of cotton. Also rayon. Again, think about it. This really fibrous nature of cellulose is what's giving us these fibers that we can then knit into fabric and make clothing from. The last place that you will encounter cellulose on an absolute daily basis will be in materials that we use for building. Wood. It's no surprise that the majority of wood is actually cellulose. Think about how strong it is and how strong those fibers are. But in addition, you can use cellulose as insulation in buildings. And so it's entirely possible that as you're listening to this talk right now, you're learning about cell walls, that you might actually be sitting on a chair made out of wood, cellulose, in a house that has wood, cellulose, potentially wearing clothes made out of cellulose fibers, and even taking notes on paper that's made from cellulose. So cellulose is actually one of the most ubiquitous sugar molecules that we will encounter in our daily lives. But it's not the only one that's important for plant cell wall structure and function. So what about the gel matrix? So the gel matrix, more recently, we have discovered to be a little bit more important than we thought. So we used to just think it was a gel within which the fibers sat, and that it was relatively passive. And now we know it actually plays a much larger role in regulating cell shape change than ever thought before. So what is the gel matrix made out of? And now I'm going to, again, restrict us to plants but also a little bit about seaweeds. And that's because we know a bit more about what this gel matrix might be made of within their polysaccharide cell wall. So in plants, you mostly have pectin making up that gel matrix. And in seaweeds, again, like my favorite one here, fucus, which we'll talk about in part three, you mostly have the polysaccharide called alginate. So I'm going to show you an example of what the molecule for a very common pectin looks like. It's called homogalacturonan. And so homo means same. Galacturonan is because it's just chains of galacturonic acid stuck together. So unlike glucose stuck together in that nice linear molecule for cellulose, here what we have is galacturonic acid connected in series. And you can see already that doesn't form that nice linear molecule. Instead, it's a little bit kinked. And what happens is when these 
Negative charges get exposed in the center of the chain here. It can cross-link with calcium, which is a positively charged ion, bring together two chains, and give you gelation. So you can imagine chain upon chain upon chain stacked up with calcium fitting into all these little negatively charged pockets, and now you have not a fluid, not a bunch of polysaccharides just sort of wibbling around, but instead a solid and set gel. Okay, so pectin gels, but so does alginate. Now, the polysaccharides that make up alginate are different than those that make up, for example, homogalacturonate. Nonetheless, they still have a really similar structural property in that they create little pockets which between chains can cross-link calcium. So we have two incredibly evolutionary distinct groups, both of which have calcium cross-link gels that we believe are essential to their cell walls function in regulating cell growth. And we're going to talk about both of those a little bit more in part one with respect to plants, or sorry, part two with respect to plants, and part three with respect to seaweeds. So where might you have encountered gels like pectin and alginate? Well, in things that are kind of jelly. So you might think about jam or jelly and how it gets set so that when you pull it out of the jar, it spreads nicely onto your toast. That is pectin. And oftentimes we'll add pectin when we're making jam, but other times the fruit is already so high in pectin and high in calcium that it will set all on its own. Alginate and pectin are both used as thickeners in many foods. For example, I'm showing you ice cream here, delicious and nutritious, but also silky and rich, and part of that is because alginate is usually added in to help them be a little bit less crystalline, a little bit more smooth to your mouth. So mostly when we think about pectin and alginate and how we encounter them in our lives, it's through foodstuffs. But they can also be used for medical applications, so creating capsules for pills and things like this. There's a lot of reasons why we might want to use gels for human use, and these are two really useful types of gels that we can actually get a lot of quite readily. Okay, so now we have cellulose fibers. They're embedded in these gels, and the gels are either mostly pectin if you're a plant, or perhaps mostly alginate if you're a seaweed. But how are those things tied together? Well, what we know is that there are crosslinks within cell walls as well. And here I'm just going to focus on plants for a moment, and that's because we don't actually know too much about the crosslinks that might exist in seaweed cell walls. But in plants, we know quite a bit now. Plants have both hemicelluloses and lignin, and both of these molecules can serve a crosslinking function. Let's take a look at a really simple example of a hemicellulose, and we're going to build it up. This is called xyloglucan. So it starts with an almost identical chain of sugars as you would find in cellulose. However, what happens is that we add on extra sugars as side branches. Here we have xylose, but we might also add on, for example, galactose. And if you think about it, what this does is stop it from being just a simple linear chain that can crystallize really nicely. And instead, we're adding on some fuzzy branches, which means while it might still be able to bind to cellulose fibers, it's not going to form that really crystalline nature, and so it acts as a really nice cross-linker. So the example that I just talked about, xyloglucan, is actually incredibly present in Arabidopsis, which is one of the plants that we work with. But for example, grasses have different types of hemicelluloses. And so in grasses, you have something called arabinoxylan, and if you break it down in its parts, it's arabinose plus xylose put together, and this is what it looks like. So it's a little bit more complex than xyloglucan, but again, you still have some nice linear regions that might be able to actually fit in well with this crystalline cellulose structure. Plants also have lignans. Now, lignans are not polysaccharides. In fact, they are phenolic compounds. And I'll show you three of the most common monolignols that we can find in plants here. And these phenolic compounds will come together in more complex structures, and are, they're incredibly reactive, and they act almost like glue that really sticks bits of the cell wall together. We find them mostly in plants when the cells have finalized their shape, so they're no longer growing, and it's okay for that material to become really quite rigid and quite sticky. Very high in wood, for example, and so that's a lot of where wood strength comes from. Well, this can actually make things a bit sticky for biofuels. Although we're not going to talk too much about how biofuels are produced from plants today, what you can imagine is if I have this cell wall material over here, 
that's got this really sticky lignin cross-linking in it, I actually have to go through some pretty serious pretreatments, for example, here with sulfuric acid, to actually break up that lignin component. And so while we want to harvest the polysaccharides from the cell wall to make bioethanol, which is demonstrated here, we need to get rid of that incredibly sticky lignin in order to do it. And so while this particular molecule <clears throat> is really necessary for plant cell walls function, their strength, it actually makes it a really challenging property for human use. So now we know that cell walls in plants, at least, are basically made up of cellulose embedded in a gel matrix, cross-linked by hemicellulosis and lignin. So let's recap again what we've learned so far. Plant cell wall structure, we know that cell walls are made of cellulose, gel matrices, crosslinks, and some proteins. And these structures and the way the molecules are arranged are actually really important for their functions for the plants, but also for us. So cellulose is strong and fibrous. That makes it a great material. Gel matrices, those gels that really embed the fibrous polymers, their gelling is really important for us, for example, in our foods. We also learned that the cross-links, for example, and lignin, hemicellulose and lignin, really provide strength and knit the wall together. And so all three of these types of components are required for the cell wall to perform its function, but we've interestingly found ways to use all three of these types of components. So the wall polysaccharide properties make them both useful, but potentially also challenging. So what does a cell wall actually look like? And what I have beside me here is a diagram that I was taught in school. This is a cell wall. We have cellulose fibers. It's embedded in a pectin gel. And there's some wiggly little cross links around there in green. Those are the hemicelluloses. But is that really what a cell wall looks like? Well, our advances in technology are becoming better. And we now have a slightly different view of a plant cell wall. So here's another cartoon example. But it looks a little bit more complicated. And here we have proteins in there as well. We have different types of hemicelluloses, different types of pectins. But we're still having a fibrous matrix within which everything is embedded in that gel. And so this comes from a really nice review paper, which also has an incredibly good teaching poster. So if you happen to want to learn a little bit more about how complicated cell walls can be and how their different components are made, you can find that here. OK, again, we're still looking at a cartoon, though. Do we have any better idea now of what a cell wall looks like? Is it really just this rigid looking structure of fibers? Well, it's another cartoon, but I promise we're getting to a real microscopy image. But this is an artist's rendering of what we might think of a cell wall a little bit more like now. So here, the cellulose fibers are in blue. We have green hemicellulose linkages, but you can see they're not everywhere. They're actually in little patches, what we call hot spots. So they're not coating all the fibers, we don't think anymore. Instead, they're just connecting them at particular places. But in addition, you can see that there's some more complexity to the pectin matrix here in yellow. It's not just a gel within which things are passively embedded. Instead, there's different types of pectin that have different properties that give connection, but also structure to the cell wall. So now I'll show you one image that actually shows us what a cell wall might look like to the eye if we could see something that small. This is a piece of cellulose, uh, sorry, this is a piece of cell wall taken from an onion epidermal cell. And what you can see here are the fibers very plainly. So this would most likely be cellulose that you're looking at. This is done with an atomic force microscope. It's essentially almost like a record player that goes across the surface and feels going up and down and can recreate what the surface looks like at a very, very small level. What we can't see very well here, though, is that there are hemicelluloses. There are pectins here. It's just kind of difficult because the thing that pops out most readily, both to the microscope and our eye, are those long fibers. So we're still not quite there. We know what's in the cell wall in some of our model species, but not all plants. And we also have an idea of what the structure might look like, but we're still really just making headway more recently with some of our advanced technologies of knowing what it might actually look like. And knowing what it looks like in one species could be very different from what it looks like in another, one time from another as well. So if we recap about the structure of the cell wall, it's still a big unknown, and our ideas of cell wall structure are ever evolving. 
And that's due to new technology and combinations of methods from different disciplines that have been essential in allowing us to learn what we know so far. But a better understanding of the structure of the cell wall would really help us to understand the bio biology and also facilitate our use of cell wall materials. So if we think about the cell wall functions that we talked about at the beginning and its composition and structure, what can we say? Well, we know that the connection between plant cells is actually due a lot to what we call the middle lamella, which is the area between two cell walls here, and that's really pectin rich. So pectin is the molecule that helps fruit soften. It helps those cells fall apart when you bite into it with your mouth. So the separation of cells has a lot to do with pectin. But if you think about it, the strength is probably mostly due to cellulose and possibly lignin, as we mentioned before. The protection can actually be due to any molecule within that cell wall. Some of them are antifedants because of their physical nature. They're spiky and hard. But some of them actually taste bad, for example, lignans and other phenolics. But when it comes to cell growth and shape, everything in the cell wall is important. And that's what we're going to focus on in the second part of this series, where we're going to look at cell shape and growth in Arabidopsis thaliana. But in the end, remember, we had cell walls with polysaccharide matrices across the kingdom of life. And so one of the questions that we might ask are, are there similar structure function relationships that occur across this tree of life? And so that's what we'll try and address in the third part of the series, where we look at what we've learned about plant cell walls and how they regulate cell growth, and whether or not that's also true in brown algae or seaweeds. <laughs>